the post lunch lecture and then in the dick of the job. So I gotta make sure you guys are up and you know not slumbering because that would not be good. By the way, this is a painting of a very famous painter in Phoenix. Unfortunately, his paintings go for pittance because nobody knows about him. This is me. So <laughs> someday they'll, my family will probably be selling it for millions, but not yet. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. I'm the chief of Hemanc at the county hospital in uh, Phoenix. As Binay knows, uh, I can talk about breast cancer for three days, but this is a 30-minute talk, so <laughs> let's get on with it. No conflict of interest. I'm going to begin with what was 20 years ago the most difficult part of breast cancer. 20 plus years ago, if you to put up a slide, it would say ER positive is the best deal, and the triple negatives, and of course the most aggressive breast cancer was HER2 positive. HER2 positive is about 20, 25, 30% depending on who you read. It is a tumor that is far more aggressive in terms of dividing, spreading, metastasizing, killing. Though before treatments arrived, this was a tumor which had uniformly would have recurred in two to three years after surgery and uh, killed the largest number of women. But Lo and behold, in oncology, the, the worst, most progressive tumors are the first ones to be tamed because something is found that basically controls them. And the HER2 receptor and treatments directed against HER2 became the first idea that several types of breast cancer will become curable in our lifetime. So here is a HER2 receptor. We have HER1, HER2, HER3, HER4. And <clears throat> they need to dimerize before they activate. So they need to sort of, two of them need to come together and conspire before the activation of the cascade happens and the cell would then get the message. Singularly, a, a receptor itself would not be able to do much. So the dimerization happens between two and then the bad things happen. When you have a HER2 positive breast cancer, <clears throat> it is far more likely to be hormone resistant, far more likely to be resistant to standard chemotherapy, et cetera. And so there are several strategies that developed to block HER2 from a antibody like Herceptin or Tristizumab to a oral molecule like Lapatinib, which is a small molecule gets in and blocks the ligand from inside to several other strategies. But the reason I took it up front is because some of the most exciting developments have taken place in HER2 positive breast cancer. Adjuvant treatment. This is where we don't know where the smallest tumor is going to be when we finally decide enough is enough. Right now, 45 centimeter tumor with HER2 positive disease will still merit treatment with one year of Herceptin because this is such an effective remedy. And we don't know if 0.5 by itself, uh, if left alone, would come back and create a problem. So less than 0.5, still people are saying we probably don't need to treat. Less than 0.5 is ER positive, more likely not to treat because you have the hormone deprivation strategies to go after. But it is one area where if you have a HERS2 positive breast cancer, an oncologist feels much better if he's able to offer one year of trastuzumab because the chances of cure are now approaching upwards of 90%. So it is, it is an area where you have a brilliant treatment and you don't really want to miss a patient who could have received it. Once the disease comes back at this moment, it still remains incurable. So it's an area where one year of treatment seems like a small price to play because you really have a great chance of a normal lifetime. In the adjuvant setting, another new idea that came in the last few years is to use a combination. So the same company that made trastuzumab also came up with pertuzumab. <clears throat> it's a pan her blocker, blocks more than two areas. And by itself, it is approved in, in metastatic setting in second, third line. But in neoadjuvant setting, it is a brilliant concept when you combine it with a chemo agent like Texol and Herceptin uh, 
large HER2 positive tumors within a few weeks start to disappear. I have women where by the time second or third month enters, nobody can feel the tumor because there's the combination of blockade of both trastuzumab and pertuzumab seems to be a very, very powerful tool. And you can combine it with just simply Texol or you can combine it with a standard regimen like TCH. Would I do it on everybody? Probably not. Um, have I a clear cut idea of who I would use? The triple drug versus <clears throat> standard TCH, I'm not sure. If I think patient is very high risk, uh, I might go that route. The cost bothers me because additional cost of pertuzumab to Herceptin and Taxol on a monthly basis adds to several thousand dollars and that's a, it's a problem to be discussed at some stage because most of the drug costs are becoming somewhat out of control. But nonetheless, this is a very, very effective combination. And I want to put in a word saying, if you're not considering it, do consider it. It is fairly easily tolerated. My choice still remains TCH. So you have Texol, carboplatin, Herceptin. Herceptin initially, weekly, when subsequently, when the TCH part is over, the six cycles, Herceptin continues every three weeks at six milligrams for a year. Herceptin is cardiotoxic, and so a baseline MUGA is necessary. Uh, it's a different kind of a cardiotoxicity. <clears throat> I want to tell you a story of A before T. So, in about an hour, almost seven years ago, I had a young woman, 34 years of age, large aggressive tumor, grade 3, her 2 positive. I decided to, at that time, the prevailing wisdom was atriamycin cytoxan followed by Texol or Zeppelin. Everybody was doing it. ECH was sort of being poo pooed as saying it's slightly inferior to atriamycin <coughs> Texol followed by Zeppelin. So I gave her atriamycin cytoxan. In the second or third cycle, she started developing a little bit of shortness of breath, a little puffiness around the face, some bleeding. 34 years of age, two children. Uh, they stopped atriamycin, repeated her echo. Her ejection infection had dropped to 29%. It was 65 and we started. We stopped atriamycin, continued Texol. Again, this woman continued to have and pop, finished her chemo, never could go on her cell. She was a HER2 positive patient who will now not receive one molecule which would have cured her. So then the question came up in my mind, and now she's fortunately still remains cured. But for every time she came, and this is one of the most loving patients who, you know, they, who wish nothing bad would ever happen to her. She would, every time she would come, even carrying a bag would make her slightly short of breath. And I realized for next 10, 15, 20 years, if there is now no great improvement in her cardiotoxicity, She's always going to have a problem walking from a car to a grocery store, carrying a child, or carrying a grandchild. And it also deprived her of the chance of getting trastuzumab, which is the best medication possible for her to cause breast cancer. So since then, on a personal basis, most of us decide based on large trials and things like that. I also decide on what life and experiences teach me. I physically decided I'm not going to use it there myself. And those women who require Herceptin. So my default go-to regime became TCH. It might be a tiny bit less efficacious, but I don't want to ever face the possibility that in a HER2 positive disease, I will never get to use Herceptin. So that's one thing I want to tell you. Consider it. In people who are cardiac, so say patients who have hypertensive cardiac disease, coronary artery disease, they just had an MI, and are now diagnosed to have uh, breast cancer. Obviously, neither adriamycin nor trastuzumab are a great choice. And the third bullet, lapatinib plus uh, chemo, is quite acceptable. It is not as efficacious, but you have no choice. You know, you have less chance of a cardiac toxicity. And I have at currently about five women on this protocol who will finish one year on Tiger before they go on to be without treatment. The 
numbers with Herceptin alone, used with other chemotherapy, were so astoundingly good that to improve upon it was hard, and, and the combination of pertuzumab has managed to do that, so I remain fairly impressed by that. That's my thought on adjuvant. The important thing here, something happened there. <laughs> Somebody's phone's talking to them? Yeah. These days, yes. <laughs> so, old-fashioned ideas on breast cancer, where nodes were important, size was important, age was important, in her two positive disease, this does not really matter. It's a small tumor or large tumor. Node positive, node negative. What's the patient's age? Does not matter. If they go on Herceptin, they're going to be cured, they're going to be cured. This is a brilliant drug which has basically made a, a adjuvant chemotherapy almost a pleasure because if, and we, my surgeon and I have a basic arrangement where 90% of patients we treat are in neoadjuvant setting. So they are, unless they are very small tumors or unless we know that there is a multicentric disease and she will require modified radical mastectomy or it's her choice that she wants to breast out or there are some other reasons why there's a small breast and a very large tumor and modified radical mastectomy is the only surgical option. Everybody I treat gets the new chemotherapy. We do the chemo first, shrink the tumor as far as possible, then breast conservation. And in her two positive disease, so it gives me a chance to see what's actually happening to the tumor and it disappears. 65% in our practice now, where when the surgeon finally takes the patient for surgery, they basically go by where the original marker was. There is no palpable tumor. So that is very impressive to see. If you took that tumor out first, and now you are doing chemo, you're hoping the drug is working at micrometastatic level. You have no proof. But neoadjuvant therapy is, is a pleasure for a medical oncologist because what you have chosen is working, and you have a visible proof of that. So that's very good. Texol for Herceptin is in press. Uh, <clears throat> very interesting protocol. Three years disease-free survival, 98.7. So 80 milligrams per meter square of Texol. Herceptin, 2 milligram weekly for 12 weeks, followed by three weekly Herceptin for 13 doses. Total one year of treatment. Uh, this we are waiting to see how exactly the publication looks. But this is a non-adriamycin probably easy to use protocol, again, with a fairly reasonable cost. And I'm not sure how this will pan against uh, the pertuzumab combos, but it remains a very, very nice alternative. And we're waiting to see exactly what they are talking about. As right now, it's basically at an abstract level. So we talked about dual targeting and adjuvant setting, and that's a very exciting concept, except for, again, the cost. What about metastatic disease? So one of the questions I ask is, if somebody comes with metastatic breast cancer with HER2 positive, what, when was the Herceptin last used? If the Herceptin patient with a progressive while on a adjuvant Herceptin, you got a problem. You have that small subset of 10 plus percent patients who are innately HER2 Herceptin resistant, and you better find another alternative. So those are really trouble. Similarly, people who within six months or a year of finishing actual treatment are starting to relax. You got a problem. One year of Herceptin did not cure them. And there is some other driver in that malignancy which is going to change the story. So it's very important for me to know when was Herceptin used. Did it happen? The progression happened on Herceptin, in which case I consider that a Herceptin failure, and I need better answers. If there has been a long time, let's say more than a year, when Herceptin was used, I might still go back to Herceptin, second time around, and there are brilliant responses to it, even though now we have a non-curable tumor. There's, of course, Herceptin plus pertuzumab, which is an acceptable FDA-approved alternative. Again, works pretty well. My choice, as soon as I can use it, is a drug called Catsilla. This is the great TDM1. So, Again, as this was described this morning in lymphoma, you have these cells which are expressing these switches, which are HER2. You're using Herceptin now as a guided missile. It's going to go and lock into the HER2 receptor. 
Behind the molecule is a drug conjugate or emetensine. It's a chemotherapy drug in a very tiny nano amount attached to every perceptin molecule. So the breast cancer cell that has these receptors on the surface allows perceptin to be attached. Once it attaches, it takes the molecule inside the cell in a vacuum. As it is taking it inside the cell, the molecule disintegrates and the emetensin is released, killing only that cell. And so we have now about 15 patients who were progressing on Herceptin or progressed quickly after Herceptin was over. We tried something else because Catsilla is approved for a second line and moved on to Catsilla. And each one of them, the response has been dramatic. Dramatic to the point where I have at least five women where again the disease has disappeared to the point where we don't know if it's there anywhere. No scans are positive, nothing on physical exam. I'm sure it's there, and I'm not sure how long I'm gonna leave them on this drug. I don't know what long-term toxicity to accept because it's such a new drug, but works like a charm. I had one woman where I had to stop because she developed a uh, liver problem. On a biopsy, we were able to see something called nodular non-serotic fibrosis. It's a kind of a portal hypertension, and that the liver numbers have reversed, but the disease has started to progress, and other alternatives are not working so well. So it is, it's a problem when you, the, the known lived side effects of emetensine seem to be in liver. This is the TDM1. <clears throat> you have a molecule, as it is indicated on the upper side, uh, it's an antibody to which the drug is attached, and once it is given, it is taken in by the cell, released, the drug is released only within the cells, and the cells die. So it's, it's a great concept. We, there are immunoconjugates, there are radioconjugates, and there are, of course, chemoconjugates. Almost 1988, ASCO, somebody had presented a drug conjugate with methotrexate. The idea had started to take hold but now it's possible that several of the drugs will come using the monoclonal antibody only to identify and attach to a cell. So that's ER positive disease, that's a good news story. It's so successful that in fact for the 10% who don't respond, other strategies are desperately needed because these are really people in trouble. There's something else going on besides a HER2 um, expression. ER positive disease is the second good story. The ER positive disease was the original good story because now you had, you know, tamoxifen is the first targeted drug. We all think of rituxan and uh, Herceptin and, and Gleevec as targeted drugs, but 1988, a selective estrogen receptor modifier arrived and that was the first targeted drug. So you had ER positive disease you had a chance to completely eliminate remaining micrometastasis by leaving a woman on this for five years. Following tamoxifen in mid-90s came the aromatase inhibitors, and one after the other, alternatives emerged. So ER positive breast cancer. I have several concerns here. Uh, somewhere in 2009, I published an article on <coughs> patients who where ER positive but did not express PR. So progesterone receptor is pretty crucial for tamoxifen to be able to act as a anti-estrogen drug. And if you don't express PR, just having ER doesn't help. Second thing is a 100% ER will respond far better to hormonal manipulation than a five or 10% ER. So it's kind of a gradation. So you have 100 to zero in ER and 100 to zero in PR, somebody that is 5%, 10% ER and 0% PR is gonna behave like a triple negative patient. Very bad outcome. Yeah. It, I won't leave the... <laughs> I shall now be tethered to the mic. <laughs> Since you've all woken up, I don't need to walk around, so we're okay. Is the percentage of ER expression important? Yes, so it's a continuum. If you have a 100% ER, 100% PR, HER2 negative patient, that patient will benefit maximally from hormone manipulation. 
If you have 10, 15 percent ER and zero PR, that patient is going to behave like a triple negative tumor. And I use that to decide intensity of chemotherapy when I decide to do uh, adjuvant or neoadjuvant treatment. Now, I've had patients who have presented with a large ER positive tumor. So we saw a woman in her 70s with 10 plus years of a tumor that is just sitting here. In negative nodes, nothing in the bones, nothing anywhere else. In fact, I was almost worried if we biopsy her, then things will sort of will tempt the fate and change her destiny. And we, of course, did biopsy her. So in her case, it was the biology. This is a ER positive tumor. Again, 100% ER expressed, no R2. And something about her immunity never allowed her to get out of her breast. So it got to 15 centimeter size, zero nodes, and all her scans negative. Finally, we convinced her to get, go for a mastectomy. She did, didn't want any further treatment. We didn't push any further treatment. Her biology suggested that this tumor was not gonna be in a bothersome mood. And several years have gone by and nothing has happened. So we say, okay, one centimeter is good, 15 centimeters is bad. Again, what is inside? It's at the, the issue is at the level of biology. Which women with ER positive HER2 negative tumor benefit from chemotherapy? So there's a lot of thought on that. And the current classification of breast cancer is becoming very sophisticated. Uh, Chuck Paru and his group have been continuously publishing since 2000, 2001, newer classifications. And so these are basically genomic classifications. They dovetail with our clinical impressions. We have a basal-like tumor, which seems to arise from the base of the duct. And then you have the surface, which is the covering the duct. So those are the luminal tumors, which are ER positive. But something that comes away from the base is a different tumor. So you have three different kinds of molecular biology here. One is HER2 positive. Other is ER positive, which is the luminal or the lumen lining cells. And then way from the base are the tumor cells which are totally different animals. When they become malignant, we don't have drivers, we don't have targets, we do not completely understand how they behave. They do not follow anatomy, they don't go to the lymph nodes, they travel through the breast, they get into a blood supply and metastasize. If you have a grade three triple negative tumor, it is a given that it has metastasized, no matter what size. It doesn't matter if they don't have nodes because they don't go to the nodes. These are the Enemy cells, they don't ask for permission. They are there. You open the door and you don't see them, but they will come through the windows and the ducts. So that's the kind of tumor we have. And so the whole issue here again is, what are we dealing with and where are we? And will genetic information or gene expression profiles help us decide how to manage them? So somewhere in the last 10, 15 years, again, there was one progress, and that was for ER positive node negative disease. I think before that happened, in preceding 20 years, I was in my fellowship when the first paper about adjuvant chemotherapy for breast cancer was published. This was in 1975 from the group from Italy, Gianni Bonadonna. And they basically came up with the idea that if you have node positive disease, after mastectomy and you gave CMF, you saved some more women. So 60% were cured with mastectomy, 40% recurred. You took those 40%, took the node positive ones, gave them chemo, another 60% were cured. It was a life shattering new news because we were not doing adjuvant chemo at that time. Surgeon took out what they could. If they came back, we treated. So this whole paradigm moved. From 1975 until early 2000 or maybe 2003, four, Lot of women with grade one tumor, fully ER positive, two, three, four centimeter in size, node negative, got unnecessary chemotherapy. These were low grade tumors. They suffered the side effects of chemo. They suffered the hair loss. They suffered the adriamycin related toxicities. And they were not going to be benefited in terms of survival because these things were not going to matter. So they came up with a genomic recurrence score is you can basically send a tissue to a company in California or another company somewhere else. These are the companies that come up with what is known as recurrence score. If the recurrence score is high in a node negative ER positive cancer, you give chemo. Recurrence score is low, 
spared the woman chemo, put her on hormones right away. So we moved one step further in several thousand women, because if you have 240,000 new breast cancers a year and 60% are ER positive, several thousand would be spared chemo if they didn't need it. And it's not just a question of they didn't need it, they were not gonna benefit. They had such a slow growing tumor, your firing chemo at it was not gonna matter. It's like a difference between a hare and a tortoise. If the hare runs, you can shoot it with a bullet and maybe the hare won't move. But a turtle, every time you look back, it's slowly crawling, try shooting it, it sort of sits down there and after a few years, starts moving again. I have had ER positive breast cancer patients I have treated in early 80s that recurred 20 years later. I pronounced some people cured and had parties for them who 20, 25 years later wrote to me saying, it's back. It's back in bones, and what was it doing so far? Where was it hiding? What was the reason for dormancy, and why are the drum beats again, on again? I have no idea. But those people would not have benefited from chemo because nothing was dividing fast enough. Nothing was growing that chemo could knock down. It was the biology. So we learned that in the last few years, and today we can spare women with grade one tumor, even node positive, I do recurrent scores. So if we have two, three centimeter tumor, two, three nodes, grade one tumor, I send it for recurrent score, it's low, I'll put them on tamoxifen or AI and move on. So recurrent score is good, it identifies the bad news within the molecular biology, and future of oncology is here, because most tumors we will try to find out genomically who's gonna benefit from chemo and who will not. A trial was conducted, we were part of it at UIC. This was a trial which basically looked at people with node negative disease. Um, people with low recurrence score got hormones, high recurrence got chemo plus hormones, and the intermediate ones were randomized to one or the other group. The results are not out yet, another few years before we know. We need to know when the cutoff is. We know what's low, we know what's high, but between 11 and 25, what's the magic number? We don't know yet. Another great painting by the same <laughs> budding artist in the same part of the world, okay. Good and bad. So what's good about estrogen positive breast cancer is also bad about it. These low grade tumors don't kill right away, don't come back right away. People seem to live long time, but they also, like a tortoise, are never completely gone. When you, you never can assure a grade one to two ER positive tumor woman that it's over. Whereas an ER positive grade, a triple negative grade three, or a triple negative HER2, if three to five years it's not back, it's not back, it's over. If it did not show up, then there are no clones left. Here there are clones left, God knows what they're doing. So that's, that's the worry. So it's good news is that you can have long life, bad news is that it's never gonna be completely gone. Low grade can keep coming back for years and decades. <clears throat> And as I say, low ER, zero PR, deadly. So 10, 20% ER, zero PR are tumors that worry me because they are gonna behave like a triple negative tumor. When a metastatic breast cancer happens in ER positive disease, right now we have several strategies. If they are on tamoxifen, they go on AI plus um, Zolodex or something. If they are on one AI, we can go to another AI. But in the last few years, we realize that these are also the people that have another driver activated. And that's where the Affinitor came in. So a combination of Affinitor with an AI uh, can add to the patients who have difficult disease, some survival advantage, and some quality of life. Affinitor is not an easy drug. <clears throat> there are lung side effects. There are oral side effects if you, those nurses who are in the audience, if somebody's on Affinitor, initially watch them every week because they may get oral ulcers, they may not report, and they'll turn into very bad beyond uh, treatment type ulcers. So keep an eye. Uh, these, are diff these are not mucositis type things. These are really deep ulcers that develop and can become quite troublesome. So it's, it's a drug where you have to keep an eye on the patient. Patient education is crucial but it does seem to add value. Regardless of tumor type, stage, chemo, biology trumps anatomy and histology. High proliferative state benefits from chemo. 
This is the crucial part you've got to know. So in all of the breast cancer, you simply can't say it's a three centimeter tumor, it's got three nodes, this gets chemo and this doesn't. You must understand at cell level what's going to be the behavior and can you alter it? You can sometimes know the behavior, but can you alter it with chemo? There is a group of tumors called cloud in low. <clears throat> These are part of triple negative tumors. Most triple negative tumors we think grow very quickly and they respond nicely to effective chemotherapy. Cloud in low is triple negative, but slowly growing. It's turtle within the, within the doves. And again, it requires a totally different strategy because it is full of stem cells. And stem cells are what are gonna metastasize form nests and come back. So if there are within even triple negative tumors, small clusters of patients which require a different strategy. For a while, we were very excited. Triple negative tumor had a very clear pathway for control. It was called PARP inhibitor. And triple negative tumor has sort of a two-legged uh, approach to its survival. And one of the legs was basically this PARP. You could inhibit, the tumor would get destroyed. The tumor's repair mechanism got hampered. This has not really panned out so far. Uh, the initial trials of PARP inhibitors were watched very carefully and with a lot of hope, but they've not really added to the overall survival. So people who are in developmental therapeutics have gone back to the drawing board. It still may be good news in the future, but it hasn't come yet. So. Finally, coming to the worst part of the news. So the HER2 we have sort of mounted and, and have a good news story. ER was always a good news story with tamoxifen and AI and, and the fact that a lot of them give many years of life to a woman. Triple negative is not even a traditional breast cancer. It's something else altogether. It has a different biology. It just happens to be in breast cancer. We'll need to find if this has got drivers similar to non-small cell lung or melanoma. What is this particular entity? Because while it happens to de develop in breast cancer, strategies that seem to work for other breast cancers are useless here. It's more diagnosed in younger women, higher in African Americans, higher in Hispanics, and higher in women with BRCA mutations. The story about African Americans, uh, Nigeria, in Kenya, since 1988, since tamoxifen was found, women would find breast lump, go to the surgeons, mastectomy would be done. All of them would be put on tamoxifen, which was Nalvodex in those days, very expensive from the United States. And they would spend a good deal of money on it for the next five years. <clears throat> when somebody went back and checked in Lagos what was the incidence of ER positive tumor, 90% of women were triple negative. In African genome, triple negative is the genome. The ER positive is an aberration there. So all these women, because they couldn't afford to get ER testing or they didn't have facility for ER testing, spent money on it, developed DVT, developed endometrial CA, and did not benefit from it. If you look at African-American women in the United States, which is a mix of genome between the African gene and the genes within the United States, there's a 40% triple negative tumor. And what's the triple negative tumor in Caucasian women? 15%. So you gotta know what your biology is again. You cannot develop a treatment in China and suddenly say it'll work in Sweden. Chinese people are one genome and their risk factors are different, we know that. And same thing holds true for breast cancer. So it's become pretty clear that some populations, for example, half of my patients in Phoenix are Hispanics, and there is a very high incidence of aggressive triple negative tumor in young women. I've never seen such aggressive tumors. They have a different genome of some kind. We really have not been able to figure out what drives it, but these tumors grow right in front of you, right through most of the chemos. So we are stuck with a new classification. Most of it has some good news. The last column still requires a lot of work and research. It has sort of moved in a different category, but we now know that a stem cell that begins at the base of a breast ductule, if it be developed to develop a tumor, it'll develop a cloud in low. If it started to differentiate a little bit, you would get a basal or triple negative tumor. 
if it went on to develop and developed its complete ability to line the duct, now its forefront of what is going to conduct the milk, it is of course a hormonally sensitive ER positive cancer that develops there, and some of them may develop a HER2 receptor and develop a HER2 positive disease. So we realize now that we somewhat know what these tumors are. If you look at the Claudine Low, there's much more quantity of mesenchymal cells versus the luminal cell. And mesenchyme is what? Sarcomas, right? The, the, and we really don't know how to treat sarcoma. We are completely blind, leading blind, when we get a patient referred for sarcoma. So triple negative tumors, are they sort of sarcomas or breast? Not really, but that's the characteristic they develop. We, in last 30, 40 years, would find one drug, adriamycin, seems to work in most of them. We use it in everybody. And then find few other tumors and use it there. We had no concept that tumors were different, people were different, and genomically, you simply can't take one drug and use it on another tumor. You gotta know what's gonna work. So there's a paradigm change. <clears throat> Some tumors are treated even though they are less than 0.5 centimeters. <clears throat> nodes meant chemo. Nodes not necessarily mean chemo now if it's strong ER positive. And finally, ER good triple, triple negative bad. But triple negative tumor, if we find an effective treatment paradigm, they're so aggressive, they'll be the first ones to be cured. Because I want to tell you again, that if you use aggressive treatment like TAC in triple negative tumor, in adjuvant, new adjuvant setting, and for three years the disease doesn't come back, like a diffuse histiocytic lymphoma, most of those women are cured. If it doesn't show up, it ain't there. You can't say that about the ER positive tumor. So it's very aggressive, high grade, may recur in three to five years. Chemo produces high pathological CR. And that's the crucial thing one needs to really know, except also to recognize there are gonna be subtypes like cloud in low where different strategies will be needed. So I wanna end this with again the same statement. The lessons of last 10 years have been very glaring. We learned that we are not alike. If I have an Indian genome, I grew up in India and I have Indian parents for 1,000 generations ahead, my genome is one genome. And if my risk factor is smoking, then I will develop one kind of tumor. But if there's a Chinese, Han Chinese genome, and their risk factor is something else, their tumors are gonna be totally different. They may look alike on an X-ray, they may look alike under a microscope, they are not the same tumors. So, your template is crucial, and what you paint over the template is crucial. And that's basically what we are now starting to realize, is that we are all different. And we will all recognize that when a tumor is diagnosed, we will need to know what is that tumor, and what is that cell type, not a generic cell type saying, okay, this is what it looks like, we know how to treat. So it's a new game, and there are no rules, and there are, at the moment, uh, very exciting times to be a breast oncologist. Thank you.